Okay, hello everyone and welcome to our, our talk, One Click to Infiltrate Your Organization via Vulnerable VS Code Extensions. So what are we gonna talk about? We'll do a quick intro, after which we'll talk about our motivation to pursue this direction, followed by uh, the processing pipeline, uh, after which we'll show some demos of vulnerable extensions with exploit, uh, and we will wrap things up with dis disclosures, fixes, and mitigations. Uh, but first, hello, my name is Raul, I'm a security researcher at SNEAK. Hi, my name is Kirill, I'm security research team lead at SNEAK. Okay, so uh, you must be asking yourselves, uh, why VS Code? Uh, but before we can answer that, uh, we need to ask a bit of a different question. Uh, why target developers in the first place? So you probably all seen this diagram of the SDLC, and by now you know that the developers' responsibilities are shifting right. Uh, they're not only writing code, testing and building, they're also releasing, deploying applications and monitoring uh, their performance real time. On the other hand, security has been shifting left. Uh, in a couple of years ago, uh, you had the security uh, expert or CISO at the end of the development cycle, testing your application and clearing it safe. But now security testing is moving closer to the uh, actual writing of code where developers spend most of their time uh, because it's really cheaper, faster, uh, and much safer uh, to test the applications there. So security is moving closer into the responsibility of developers. And this creates uh, all sorts of interesting uh, scenarios. And let's look at a couple of notable examples. So uh, first of all, uh, this is quite a famous one uh, named uh, dependency confusion. Uh, a researcher has found a way to trick uh, popular uh, package managers uh, to resolve dependencies in a way that uh, private dependence, dependencies get fetched first from public repositories, causing them uh, to execute code that was not initially intended by uh, the developers. So basically, he was able to uh, harvest a bunch of private dependencies in public uh, uh, repos of really uh, big and famous companies and was able to uh, infiltrate uh, those uh, companies uh, and the internal systems and get outside DNS calls, uh, which proved him that the uh, uh, infiltration was successful. So now developers need to worry uh, what they commit uh, in their public repos, which dependencies, private, public ones, and the private ones need to have a security reserved packages instead of them so uh, the packet managers don't get tricked in this way. Another example, uh, a research uh, done by a company called Tripwire uh, about two years ago uh, showed that uh, on patch vulnerabilities caused 27% of organization breaches. So uh, as we mentioned, the responsibility to actually deal uh, with vulnerabilities now lies in the hands of developers. So whether you get a ton of issues by your security scanning uh, applications that you need to quickly resolve, uh, or a researcher discloses some kind of vulnerability to you, this needs to get fixed uh, as quickly as possible, otherwise your organ organization gets compromised. Uh, last but not least, this is kind of a recent event, a, a popular NPM package, uh, which is a, a user agent parser, uh, got poisoned with a crypto mining malware uh, and a password stealing one just by a, an attacker being able to get hold of the, the, of the developer's credentials uh, and committing malicious versions instead of them. So these are just a few examples of a really vast range of uh, attacks that target developers. So while us normal people usually spend time in browsers and in our mobile applications and lately on Netflix, developers are doing most of their work uh, in the uh, uh, IDE. So they're writing, uh, improving, testing uh, their code and they're doing it in their integrated development environments. So what is this IDE? Basically, this is the place where uh, developers edit, build, uh, and debug their code. And they have a lot of integrations with various uh, other ecosystems, such as version, version control systems, uh, CI/CD pipelines, 
uh, cloud uh, infrastructure and other stuff, uh, as well as not work-related stuff like YouTube and Spotify and all the things that uh, you wanna do while uh, you work. So basically you get a really, really rich environment uh, to fulfill all of your needs and basically allow you to both do work and do other stuff as well. So if we're looking uh, for the popular IDEs uh, on Google, we will see Visual Studio Code right up there at number three. So if we focus on Visual Studio Code, uh, it's really popular. It has 14 million active users uh, out of uh, the 24 million uh, developers worldwide. Uh, it has a really fair industry adoption uh, and it's being used by more than uh, 4K companies uh, worldwide. And it has an extension marketplace as well. So you might argue that yes, VS Code is not an IDE. It doesn't come with all the features fully equipped out of the box. But if you install in extensions in it, then basically you can turn the relatively modest features it has out of the box to this really uh, mean machine with added language support, debuggers, parsers, and all of the integrations that uh, we've seen earlier, essentially turning this into an IDE. So if we're looking at marketplace sizes, Visual Studio Code has the largest marketplace of extensions with almost 25,000 extensions. And the runner-up uh, JetBrains has almost 6,000, which makes VS Code four or five times uh, fold uh, bigger than that. So we get kind of a big, big, big opportunity uh, for an attack surface here. So what is an extension? It's essentially an NPM package a project, excuse me, uh, with uh, added Visual Studio Code extension API that allows the developer to create all kinds of uh, triggers to run the extension integrated with Visual Studio Code itself. Uh, so basically you will have your JavaScript and TypeScript source code with the package JSON manifest uh, along with the API all bundled uh, in the VSIX uh, zip archive format. Also important to notice is that most of these extensions are open source. So you can see their uh, actual code hosted on GitHub or other uh, source hosting uh, platforms. So you must be asking yourself by now, how secure are these? And if you're looking uh, into the CVEs, you'll see that there are uh, around 25 uh, CVEs up to date. Um, which most of them are kind of the severer uh, code execution ones. And out of those 29 uh, uh, CVEs, uh, nine of them are related to uh, extensions. So let's look at uh, two examples, one of which uh, was an extension to support integration with GitLab. And basically it did not validate uh, on a Windows machine where the uh, GitHub uh, binary is being executed. And if you would uh, clone a malicious repo with that binary in it, it will get executed instead of the real one, uh, allowing an attacker to run arbitrary code on your machine. Another example uh, is uh, found in the Visual Studio Code Remote Development Extension. Uh, and a, uh, the, a researcher was uh, able to execute code by uh, injecting some argument into a call to the SSH uh, binary uh, thus, uh, again, allowing him to execute code. So you must be saying, okay, nine out of 29, that's 30%-ish, that's pretty good. But if you compare that to the size of the entire uh, marketplace, that's really small, right? You have 25,000 extensions, vulnerabilities in only nine of them, it's not that much. So this is kind of the main reason that drove us to focus in this marketplace. We thought that there's a lot more research that can be done there. So our goal was to discover and exploit vulnerabilities in popular Visual Studio Code extensions with the potential of compromising an entire organization. In order to do that, we built kind of a general processing pipeline. So basically we downloaded all of the extensions uh, from the marketplace and you can see uh, an example of that. Uh, we store them on uh, cloud storage. So you have a big list of VSIX files after which we extracted the source codes uh, and the configurations. And at this point as a general approach you can basically do whatever you want. You can run 
whatever tools you like. You can roll, run malware detection, such as Yara rules on the sources, a static analysis tool. And even if you want to take a dynamic approach, you can execute your uh, extension in a Visual Studio Code server without the UI and run dynamic analysis on it. Afterwards, uh, you can upload your uh, results into BigQuery and ask some questions on them with some uh, SQL uh, queries. And this is exactly what we did, along with uh, a bit of intuition to found uh, the vulnerabilities that we have. So without further ado, let's take a look at what we saw. Kirill? So, OK. What we were able to find? Um, let's start from instant markdown extension. It has um, one, more than 100,000 uh, installs. And essentially, the extension is uh, allow you to preview your markdown files in the browser. It has live update capabilities. Basically, on the left side, you can see the Visual Studio code with the extension installed. And on the right side, you can see the browser uh, running on localhost 8090 and, um, and having the preview in it. But before we go to the vulnerability of this extension, let's have a look at path traversal vulnerability. Um, it's kind of, I, I hope you're all familiar with the vulnerability, but let's do a quick recap. Basically, whenever you have the user input parameter and the parameter is file name, if sanitization is not done properly, malicious user can inject uh, dot dot slash payload and go outside of working directory of the server. And this way, like on the left side, you can see the um, git.png, which is valid file, but on the right side, you can see dot dot slash dot dot slash etc pass vb, which is a private file from the server and user actually a uh, malicious user actually is able to get any file on the machine. Um, this is code snippet written on Express uh, Node.js uh, uh, web server. Basically, uh, as you can see on line 16, uh, the server is listening on port 8888. And on line 7, we have the only handler for all the requests. Uh, this is function and uh, this function actually gets executed whenever any URL um, passed to the browser. And as you can see, if you, for example, execute slash index.html, uh, file on line eight will be a result to uh, home folder of the server, which is user serial server public HTML uh, slash index.html, which is request.url, like the full URL of the, uh, of the server. And um, like you can see if malicious user will specify the question mark slash dot dot slash and so on, etc. pass with the payload, basically uh, path.join will produce the uh, the path outside of the home uh, home folder and path.result eventually will result to uh, to absolute URL of etc pass with um, Interesting trick here, you may notice the question mark in the URL. Uh, it's because by default Chrome browser uh, sanitize the dot dot slash payload, it tries to resolve it automatically on the client side. And um, as you can see in the first example, basically this path will be resolved to simply etc pass VD. It's not what we want, but um, in the second example, path will be simply slash, and what goes after the question mark will be query parameter parameters, and browser will not sanitize uh, query parameters anyhow, so we can bypass the browser sanitization this way. But you may ask. Why, why are you talking about server-side uh, vulnerability in the context of plugins uh, for Visual Studio Code? What's, how, how is it relevant, right? Actually, it is because if you look at the screenshot of the extension, again, like on the left side, you have the Visual Studio Code. And inside Visual Studio Code, you have the instant markdown extension installed. 
and inside of instant markdown extension, you actually they spawn a preview HTTP server. And in the browser, it simply renders the page from the preview HTTP server, basically. And you may notice that uh, HTTP server is vulnerable to path traversal. So again, you may ask, like, how is it relevant to me personally? Because you probably have a firewall, firewall on your laptop and you don't have a static IP address, so no one can reach your laptop from outside or even work through VPN, you know, like no, no one can get actually to your laptop from outside. But it's not actually correct because if you open any URL in the browser, the URL can make uh, requests to your local host. And, and it's kind of cross-site requests, uh, common practice. Let's let's try this out. We have the vulnerable server on, it, on our localhost, and uh, let's open evil.com, which which going to make a GET request uh, to to localhost. Um, instead of evil.com, um, I'm trying it from example.com, which is the same. Uh, downstairs here, you can see the Chrome terminal, the bug terminal. And I'm trying to make a pitch request to localhost 8888 slash index HTML. You, you may see this error. Basically, uh, example.com has been blocked by course policy. OK, let's have a look. What is the course policy? Uh, it is cross-origin resource sharing uh, mechanism. Uh, this is implemented by all modern browsers right now. and uh, um, Basic restriction is that domain A cannot make, by default, cannot make any get or post request to domain B.com. Although you can uh, explicitly allow this uh, capability uh, to make this request by specifying headers, uh, uh, specific headers for HTTP requests. So Chrome, UVIN, we can do anything. Right now, actually, if you Google how to bypass course, uh, top 10 answers in Google will be you need access on the website you want to have. Basically, what's the idea? Um, as, as we know now, evil.com cannot make get requests to local host directly because of default course policy. But if on local host we have another vulnerability, which is XSS, we can inject specific payload, which will be able to make get request to localhost, right? Because it's the same domain. And we can make get or post request to evil.com because we can explicitly allow on evil.com uh, to any domain to make request to the evil.com. Sounds like a good plan, right? Uh, now we need to find XSS vulnerability on our local web server. Uh, this code snippet is basically the same code snippet as you've seen before, and it's simplified version, uh, as you may guess, it's a simplified version of the extension uh, web server, basically the same vulnerability, exactly the same code. Uh, you may notice one interesting uh, thing here is that everything is happening uh, our kind of our home folder for this, our working directory for this uh, extension is user skill. And you always work, uh, like if you open a project in Visual Studio Code, you actually always relative to your home folder in most of the cases, let's say. And what does it gives us? Actually, uh, it gives us uh, knowledge where uh, your downloads folder is located. Basically, if you can make browser to download XSS payload uh, to your like to your def default uh, downloads folder, uh, as as a malicious user, we will be able to execute this XSS payload on uh, victim's machine. Let's let's figure out how to simply download uh, how to put uh, malicious uh, XSS payload to your laptop. Uh, basically, we are again on example.com, and this simple code snippet uh, is doing exactly this. It's, uh, you can see we create the A element, and we specify data URL as 
uh, href attribute and it has the classical XSS payload, which is script tiger one. And importantly, we specify attribute download to payload HTML and execute a.click. And automatically your browser will create payload.html file in your downloads folder. After this, uh, if we, if uh, malicious uh, user will be able to open uh, localhost slash question mark dot dot slash dot dot slash download slash payload on your laptop, uh, they will be able to execute payload.html in XSS context. Let's now we have all pieces, uh, all pieces of the puzzle together. Uh, let's have a look how it works. You accidentally open evil.com like a uh, malicious uh, hacker can trick you to do it. So it could be URL shortener or anything else. And if whenever you open in the evil.com, it automatically triggers download uh, of uh, access as payload to your laptop. Um, now you have the payload.html in your downloads folder. Then it, it is able to open in iframe uh, your uh, vulnerable local uh, local server and execute XSS payload inside it. So the XSS payload will make get requests to get any file on your laptop, etc. password, SSH key, whatever, and eventually send it directly to hacker or to evil.com. Um, let's let's have a look at the demo. Let's start from the victim perspective. Basically, um, as you can see on the left side, uh, we have the Visual Studio code running and extension of uh, Instant Markdown is installed. And when user modify the readme md file, basically on the right side, you see that it has the live update and the localhost 8090 opened in the browser. And additionally, we can uh, create a file with the content secret in SSH folder on inside the home folder, my secret key in SSH folder. This is to have something uh, hacker will be able to steal. And um, just one last step for victim is to click at suspicious URL in email. It's kind of just click here in this case. And basically, you can see recursely in the browser and some obscure file was downloaded, but nothing else actually happened. Uh, it's all what a victim sees. Let's see what hacker see. Um, from hacker perspective, it looks even easier. It's kind of, we have the PHP server just to sort of explore it on the left side, on the right side, we have logs. And whenever a uh, user clicks, uh, victim clicks on the link, uh, we can see it was opened in, uh, in Chrome browser and uh, payload the content of uh, my secret key is secret. We were able to steal any file from victim's laptop. Next, next uh, extension, next vulnerability I'm going to talk uh, is Latex Workshop extension. It has much more installs, uh, almost one and a half million installs actually. And if you're not familiar with Latex, basically it's a markup language, which one of the features uh, allows to render PDF uh, files out of the markup language. And as you may guess, it has the similar uh, architecture as the previous one, basically, uh, inside Visual Studio Code, we have Latex Workshop extension. Uh, and inside the extension, we have HTTP server, which meant to render preview page for PDFs. Additionally, this uh, local HTTP server has WebSocket server inside, like to communicate back from PDF preview page to Visual Studio Code extension. And again, we have super simplified version uh, of this uh, vulnerable code. 
basically again it's express application on line six we have the only endpoint uh, which is get powercon.ico which is um, just a static file endpoint and on line 10 we actually have a websocket connection handler uh, which basically has one uh, only one uh, handler which is open to handle URLs clicked inside PDF file. But what I'm, what's important here is line 12. Actually, vscode.n is API of Visual Studio Code itself. And open external uh, is, again, API of Visual Studio Code itself. Let's have a look at the documentation. Basically, open external allows you to open a URL outside of Visual Studio Code. If it's HTTP or HTTPS, um, it automatically will open URL in a browser. If it's mail to, it will be default mail client. Um, it has like some different schemas as well, but what's important, what, what will happen if you specify file instead of HTTP, HTTPS or mail to? Actually, if we specify file, and if this file is binary file, um, Visual Studio Code will simply execute any binary on your laptop. So um, as you may guess, basically it's kind of common injection vulnerability is what we have, right? We can execute, if we, we will be able to connect your local web circuit server and send malicious payload, we will be able to execute any binary on your laptop. Sounds like a good plan again, right? Uh, the only problem we have this time is basically that our port is random. It's not like the previous time it was uh, 8090, uh, but in this case it's random. And actually it's about like, if you not go to details, it's about 16,000 ports um, range. So, Let's try to brute force it, right? Like the, the easiest possible approach. Basically, we have for loop uh, for 16,000 ports. We create 16,000 WebSocket connections. Uh, and whenever we are able to connect uh, on a specific port, it's uh, line 21 handler, uh, we can send malicious payload on line 24 and execute any file on your laptop. Let's try this out. Actually, it's it took a lot of time and it never uh, never finishes for uh, Firefox or for, for Chrome. Uh, although for Firefox, this approach already works. On Firefox, we already uh, able to brute force uh, your local ports and execute uh, any binary on a laptop for uh, for the reasonable time. But actually, in in Chrome browser, they have hidden uh, protection mechanism to protect you against brute forcing of uh, ports. Uh, after about like 10 attempt, uh, throttling was happening like five seconds for each connection. Chrome, we did it again, you're cool. We can do anything about it, right? Actually, no. Um, let's have a closer look to uh, vulnerable code. Basically, you may notice we have the endpoint, get endpoint for static file, which is image. Um, it, and it's actually, it could help us a lot because uh, instead of brute forcing ports of the WebSocket server, we can brute force ports of HTTP server. And instead of trying to connect 16,000 uh, uh, WebSocket servers, we can try to load 16,000 images on the same page which is completely fine for modern web, right? 16,000 images you can find on any page right now. And browser cannot do anything about it. Basically, um, no protection could happen here. Uh, what we're trying to do is the same loop, uh, for loop, where we create uh, ING thread on line two, and we specify SRC attribute on line eight, uh, for each port, and whenever we were able to connect uh, to, to load the image, which is handler on line four, um, we can do the same. We can basically connect to your uh, WebSocket server because it is running on the same port as your uh, vulnerable HTTP server, 
and on line nine, execute a malicious payload and basically run any command on your laptop. Let's have a look at the demo. On the left side, again, you can see uh, Visual Studio Code and a Latex Workshop installed and some text file, which is markup uh, language for uh, Visual Studio Code. On the right side, you can see the open uh, malicious URL. Um, something is happening in the background. Basically, it's a brute force of the ports. Um, and just after a couple of seconds, um, we're going to see how terminal pops up and and calculator executed. Basically, again, we were able to execute comments on uh, on victim's laptop by just opening one single uh, malicious URL. Yeah, that's it on my side. So back to your own. Okay, uh, thank you, Kirill. So as we've seen, uh, we looked at instant markdown and Latex workshop. Uh, we also found vulnerabilities in opening default browser, which is just the browser previewing uh, extension. Uh, it had a path traversal combined with a, an XSS vulnerability similar to the one we saw in Instant Markdown. And last but not least, uh, a cute little extension called Rainbow Fart. We had to mention it. It basically uh, plays uh, sound clips while you code to help you motivate. And it also had an SSRF combined with a zip slip vulnerability. So uh, why is this such a big deal? So uh, imagine you're a developer uh, working in uh, uh, somewhere with your uh, Visual Studio code and you install an extension, uh, a vulnerable one. So as we uh, were able to see, an attacker can exploit it and can obtain some uh, really, really critical data that is on your local machine, such as SSH keys, environment variables, uh, your actual source code, uh, or some other config files. Uh, but you're not working in vacuum. You're part of this organization with uh, hordes of other developers. And using this data, an attacker can compromise that entire organization. So they can reach uh, private data, uh, install some uh, persistent uh, malware uh, or tools that can uh, harvest all kinds of stuff. And in addition, uh, there's an opportunity uh, to carry out a supply chain attack. So basically uh, infiltrate that organization uh, products, infect them and attack uh, the users that are using them. So basically this is like the full blown potential of just one simple vulnerable Visual Studio Code extension. So uh, after uh, we wrapped up uh, our findings, uh, we sent uh, disclosure emails to all of the extension maintainers. Uh, and within uh, a bit short of two weeks, uh, all the vulnerabilities were fixed. So uh, kudos to uh, the maintainers and the community for doing this in a really uh, quick time. Uh, and let's look at uh, some of these fixes. So uh, in the case of Latex Workshop, uh, on the left-hand side, we see the vulnerable code. So uh, we see uh, data.url being controlled by the attacker, getting uh, unsanitized and used in the open external uh, API call. And on the right-hand side, uh, they basically removed that feature altogether because it wasn't necessary at all. So, this is like an example of you know, hanging vulnerable code that uh, there isn't really use of and you should uh, usually remove these uh, features. Uh, but a more interesting example uh, is instant markdown. So as we've, saw, uh, as we've seen, uh, it has uh, the path traversal uh, vulnerability with request.url uh, being used in the uh, path.resolve call. And basically the fix is uh, be using the send package, which uh, basically sanitizes uh, the URL that will get uh, called and removes all those dot dot slash uh, payloads, uh, essentially eliminating uh, the vulnerability. So uh, to mitigate these kind of issues, basically uh, the extension hygiene is pretty similar to uh, third package ones. So if you're a developer using extensions, 
uh, use only maintained and popular extensions uh, and don't use extensions with uh, pending security issues uh, because as we, uh, we've seen, they can be exploited. On the other side, if you're a maintainer, then uh, use security best practices when you write your code. Uh, test your code with a vulnerability scanner to make sure that it doesn't have any issues. And if you do get disclosed with vulnerabilities, uh, fix them in a quick and timely manner. So uh, this research uh, brings up a couple of additional opportunities uh, for work. So uh, we have not covered all the extensions and possible vulnerabilities that might exist uh, in uh, Visual Studio Code's marketplace. So there might be other unsafe usages of the API, such as the open external call. Uh, we can use it maybe file parsing vulnerabilities uh, because there are a lot of extensions that are uh, handling files. Uh, so that can be also a legitimate vector. Uh, and maybe who knows, uh, additional local web uh, server vulnerabilities. But if we think outside of Visual Studio Code, that, then there are plenty of other uh, IDEs and editors out there that enable extensions. So uh, they can also be targeted. Uh, they might also have vulnerabilities. So that is a good opportunity to expand uh, this approach and look at other uh, marketplaces as well. So uh, that's it, everyone. And we hope you had a good time. Uh, thanks a lot.